I'm going to talk about transformation. Are we transformed? Are you transformed? In Romans 12, 1 through 2, if you want to open there, that's where I'm going to be at. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. And just as you're doing that, I'm just going to just, just give us a prayer. You know, your Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time, Lord, for, for us to be here, Lord, Father. Give our mind, body, and souls to you, Father, just to know that we're here to praise and worship you and give you glory to everything, Lord, Father. Let us take what we can from you, the words of wisdom, the words of knowledge, to guide us through our lives, Lord, Father. Thank you for this day you have given us and the service you have um, put upon us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your responsible service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going to hit three points. My first point is, a life no longer yours. A life no longer yours. As you come to God and you find yourself in that walk of, trans, that walk of transformation, you realize that this life you take with God is a life no longer yours. Because you've given your life to God and he lives in you. And because of that, the life that you lived before in this world, it's gone. God says, that life is gone, and I've forgiven you for that. I've given you mercy and grace, and now you live for me. So according to verse 1, if we truly belong to God, we truly know how to worship, love, and give ourselves to God. Our minds need to be focused on God. And something that's very important right here is that they used to sacrifice animals in the Old Testament. They used to sacrifice animals, but these animals had no choice. They couldn't say no. Yes, they didn't, they didn't have no choice. And, it, and it's crazy because if you were the best animal, you were the one to be sacrificed. And, and it's, to me, it's crazy because you, these, these animals are the strong, tough ones and, and the ones that are really no flaws, no nothing, but they're the ones that are given as a sacrifice and basically they had no choice in their death. But God wants us to offer ourselves as a sacrifice to him. But it is your choice. You have that choice, and he's giving you that choice. He's not forcing you upon him. He's saying, you have the choice to follow me. Pick up your pen and follow me. And I heard that, and I was thinking, man, God's given us this choice. And there's millions of people who follow it and millions of people who don't. But those that do follow him, he gives to you something, a, a life that may be tough, that may be rough, but you know what? It's peaceful. It's really peaceful. And what in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it says, What know ye, not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are brought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So as you have that transformation towards God, and that life is no longer yours because God is living in you, you've taken on the Holy Spirit. You've taken on that spirit that's living in you, and you go out there and do these things for God, and you're sacrificing a lot. You are. You're giving your time on Sundays. I know the worship practice on Wednesdays, maybe some other days. You take time to, I know Pastor takes time to prepare his message. There's time that you're sacrificing. But, again, it's taking up time, but you're, not, you're doing it because you choose to. You're choosing to do that because if you chose not to and you say you live this life for God, then are you really transformed? Are you really transformed into this way for God? It made me think of uh, my parents uh, coming from Cambodia, late 1970s. They, they went through the Holocaust, the Holocaust there, and they had to flee. They had to sacrifice everything in their home country. I'm talking about personal possessions. They had to sacrifice um, their home, everything. Just a way of living. They sacrificed all of that. And it was all for a better life. A better life in here. Because if they didn't sacrifice that, if they didn't choose to leave that country, they could have just let, been led to death. They could have been led to death. And that's just like us making a choice to be with God. I mean, Romans 6 tells us that the wages of sin is death. So we choose that path, we lead to death. But you see, if you've given up all your possessions, your way of living in this world, if you give that up, 
living in, in a life of sin, if you give that up and you go towards God, he's saying, I will not let you be led to death, but I will give you everlasting life with me because I live in you. And now to ask yourself, are we giving ourselves to God as a sacrifice? Are we really devoting ourselves to him? Or are we just giving ourselves a couple days of the week, a couple hours a day? Or what, what are we doing for God? And I question myself a lot with that, I mean, especially growing up through college, you know, because your, your mind's on school. Your mind's on trying to job for extra money. And through, through college, it's just, it really, it was like point blank and think, what am I doing? Am I really giving myself to God? Yeah, I, 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 do, I did some camps. I did this. But is that the only time I'm giving myself to God? It shouldn't be. And then, as silly as this may sound, devotions, why do they call it daily devotions? Because it's something you should do daily. And that leads me to my next point. My next point is staying committed. Staying committed through this transformation. Verse 2, so once we choose to follow God, you know, we choose to follow the Spirit and not our, our flesh. Verse 2 said, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It doesn't say by the renewal of your mind, because the renewal of your mind is just, okay, my mind's changed, I'm good. No, it's the constant renewing of your mind. The constant of saying, I got to live my life for God, not just today, not just tomorrow, but for the rest of my life. Amen. It's a constant renewing. And if he wanted a renewal, he could have put renewal in the Bible, but he said renewing. Meaning it's going to keep going. It's an action. It's going to keep, it's the present. Keep going and going. And we always find it easy to come to Christ to say we're here for God, but once we continue to walk with God in that renewing of faith, it becomes very difficult. Especially for, um, you know, they always say new believers, once you come to accept God, it becomes very difficult. You get these attacks. You get these spiritual warfare, and it comes at you. And it becomes really hard because the devil's like, you know what? They're at a breaking moment. They just accepted God, and here's my, here's my turn. Or if you're, you know, if you believe in God for a long time, you hit a breaking moment, you know what? This is a breaking moment for the devil to come in because... He's like, they've been such on a spiritual high, this is my hit point to come and attack. But God says, you constantly renew yourself with me. Those words from the Bible will constantly be fresh in your mind. Those stories will be constantly fresh in your mind. And everything that you've read will be constantly fresh in your mind. Walking with God, we start to see that we have decisions that we have to make. A choice in the things we do. A choice in the things that we do. You know, do I, do I choose to go out with these groups of friends who choose to live a life in this world, or do I choose to go with these groups of friends who choose a life for God? You make that decision. You make that choice. And how do we determine that? You evaluate your choices and think, do they align with what God wants from you? Does me going out, let me go back to my college. Does me going out, partying with a bunch of people who's going to drink, who's going to, who's going to use foul language, glorify God, or do I step back and just stay home? Or even stay home and, and, and reach out to my brothers and sisters in Christ and be around that? See, if I reach out to them, I'm staying committed. That's staying committed to God, saying I'm, I'm staying with, with the people that are going to keep me aligned, keep me on track. And with our mind, we understand this world. Our mind understands this world. We understand the things that go on in this world. We understand everything that's going on. And we know the ways of this world. We know how the tricks and the games and everything in this world. But we must not live in the way of this world. We must transform and stay transformed. That is why we constantly are having that renewal of the mind to be Christ-like. You know, the daily devotions, the prayer time with God. God doesn't say, just pray to me when you need me. Just pray to me when you want me. God says, pray to me. Communicate with me. Especially, it's like when you're, when you're dating someone, you constantly talk to them. You constantly text them, phone call them. Back then, it was instant message them. You constantly do that. It's a constant. And that's what God wants from you. You just don't do it when, when, you're, when you want him or need him. But he's also saying, do it. Communicate with me when you love me. Communicate with me even if you hate me at that moment in life. Communicate with me even when you feel like life is, is captured you and you feel like giving up. Still, talk to me. Because God's telling us, he looks past that. No matter what sin you've committed, God looks past that and says, you are still my son and daughter, and I still love you. I still accept you for that. 
And that's what the constant renewal of our mind does to us. We, we may feel guilty. We may choose to go another route. But with our minds renewed, we know that God really means that because we know that communication with him. As a teacher, we're required to have, I believe, 75 hours every three years of professional development. We have to get those hours in. If not, our license could be on probation. And I have to take the test again. I have to pay a fee again. I have to do a whole bunch of things to keep my license in line. So why, though? Education is constantly changing. I have to refresh my mind constantly in education because as it changed, I need to change with it. And I need to keep it going and keep it going. And it's just like, like with God. It was just like with God. I need to stay renewed with God in the word and constantly go with it in the word. Because if I don't, I'm going to lose focus on something. And the minute I lose focus on something, the devil will come in and swipe me away. Just like if I lose focus in my professional development hours, the, the TEA, the Teacher Education Association, is going to come in and take my license away. And that's what they could do if I don't constantly keep that renewal. And one of the things that, that really hit, that hits home for me is that when you don't, constantly see that God is there and you don't constantly read the Bible and constantly keep him focused in your life and you lose focus of him, you're losing focus of your life. You really, things start to crumble, things start to fall, struggles start to happen. And the God of this age um, has blinded the minds of unbelievers, but he can also blind, and it can also blind those believers who lose focus. There are there are statistics, there are data research saying as kids go on to college who, who, who have a church home and everything like that back home, but as they go to college, a lot of them, I think it was about either 50 to 70% of them fall away from God because they start to be open to these things and that, that renewal of the mind isn't there as much. They're, they're, they're living a different life now and they lose that sight and they become blinded and you think, how? They're believers. It happens. It happens. And we all who unveiled face, faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is in the spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And this leads me to my next point, my last point. How do our struggles help us? And you think, how does that even make sense? Because when you struggle, you, you fall apart. So how is that helpful to you? We will come across struggles, tough situations, many things. I mean, you ever felt or thought about where do the tough situations come from? Perhaps you found yourself discontent with your life. Perhaps you just found you had feelings or doubt of ina inadequacy upon things that you're trying to do in life. And you just ever ask yourself, maybe you're missing God's best life for you. Missing God's best life for you because you're constantly dwelling on these struggles that are taking you down. But look at, look at it from this point of view. Our struggles help transform us. The struggle is real, but so is Jesus. And it's crazy because as Jesus is real, he's going to come in and say, you know what? That struggle has nothing on you because it has nothing on me and I live in you. He's going to let you know that there is nothing that's going to hold you down because there's nothing that's going to hold him down. Those struggles are nothing. They're just, a, they're just a, a stepping stone in the way, but you can overcome it. And those struggles, they, what they're going to do is transform you in a way to build your characteristics up to be better, better for him. How many of you are drinking tea before from a tea bag? I think most of us have. We have tea bags here. You get a tea bag, and, and it, it, it's crazy that there's tea there, and I'm using this example. But with a tea bag, there, you, you choose your flavor, you open it up, and what do you have to do with that tea bag to get the flavor? You have to stick it in hot water. Hot water. And you get in the hot water, and that flavor, it, it seeps out. It comes out. And the longer you leave it in, the more flavor that comes out. The less time you leave it in, the less, time it, uh, the less flavor that comes out. So you drink it. You don't like it. What do you change, though? You don't change that hot water you put in. You change the flavor of the tea. Because that tea is, is something you don't like. And that hot water is just a catalyst of drawing out the flavor of the tea bag and its contents of the tea bag that determine that flavor. 
And that's what it is when you're in situations. You're in hot water situations in life. And those hot water situations in your life, you can't get out of. You didn't choose that. The other day, Andrea was stuck in traffic for two hours. She could not control that. An 18-wheeler blew up on 45. It blocked all lanes for 12, like six hours of the day. She could not control that. Five in the morning to, I think it was noon, standstill traffic almost. She could not control that. She was stuck in a hot water situation. But the flavor that came out of her characteristics, what God was showing her, you need to be patient with this. Because that's going to build your character. Not just do you need to be patient with this, but you need to control your anger through this. Because I know you're angry. I would be angry. I, have, I think she was going on the way to um, practice. Practice was at 12. She texted me, I'm late. And I'm thinking, I'm sorry, I wish I could do something, but you know what? She was stuck in that situation, and the only thing you can do is let that situation, I mean, build from that situation and help it transform your characteristics for God to help you be a better person for God. And that's what God uses our struggles for. Amen. Don't question your trials and temptations. Use that to your advantage and grow from it. So that way it shows that you've defeated the devil and the things he throws at you. Because to grow strong, maybe you're feeling defeated in your spiritual walk, but you will overcome all evil with God. Amen. And there are some situations you put yourself in because it's your choice. I choose to go to this club with a group of friends where there's a lot of things I should not see or do or be tempted by. And then you get yourself in that situation, but that's your poor choice that you made. We tell kids every day, you are not a bad person. You made a bad choice. That does not make you a bad person. You made a bad choice in your life. But you still take that situation and you learn from it. You don't just keep going out and doing it and doing it and doing it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 10 says, And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure and inf- therefore I take pre- pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Those situations will extract God's strength through, through you. That's what those situations do. Don't question them. Live through them and push through them. My closing thoughts are, well, first, let me recap those three points. The first point was a life no longer yours. You've given up your old life. You've given up living in the way of this world, and you chose to live a life for God. But now what? You stay committed. That's my next point. You stay committed. And you stay committed because if you don't refresh your mind, refresh your mind, you will fall. And my last point was, Let those struggles help you, transform you. Let that transform you. And my closing thoughts, in the moment of tough tough situation, God's strength is revealed. But as you transform, your mind is renewed. God living in you is more than enough to overcome all odds in this world. Remember that. That's something I I want you to just intake and, and remember and really Take it home when you face those hot water situations. Remember that God is transforming you. He's transformed you to be a better person. Thanks. Mark chapter 14, and I just want to read one verse. Okay, can we just go, everybody say one verse. Verse 36. And this is the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. I know we just celebrated resurrection, but I just felt this because it's going to tie in. And I've never preached this. And so um, God gave me a revelation, and it's going to be quick, and so I want to share this with you. And he said, and this is when Jesus was in the Garden of Eden, and he said this, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Take away this cup from me. Everybody say, take away this cup from me. Let's read it together. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. Say, not my will, but your will. Not my will, but your will. Say it one more time. Not my will, but your will. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, helping us so that we can be transformed 
Let your word become revelation in Jesus' name. Give me 15 minutes. Here we're talking about today transformation, and here you look at Jesus. He came and he knew. Could you imagine from the moment that you were born that you knew that there, you're going to die a horrific death? What would you do? You know, that the moment you were born, you knew that the only uh, uh, destiny you had was to die a horrific death, and it's going to be painful, uh, it's going to be ugly, and most of your good friends are going to leave you. He knew all this. He, he knew all this. Uh, uh, even at a young age, uh, when he was 12 years old, he, remember his uh, mother and father, uh, his earthly mother and father was looking for him, and, 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 and they came and they found him in the temple uh, uh, discussing things with the, the teachers. And he looks at his mom, Mary, and said, Mother, don't you know I'm about my father's business? At 12 years old, he already knew his purpose and his destiny in his life. And he was always trying to do that. I got a leak here. Um, help me. Um, he, was all, he already knew what God wanted him to do. Let me ask you a question. If today, in this very moment, you knew the purpose and the plan of God in your life, and, um, uh, and you know what is going to happen, what would you do? See, the, the hardest thing for us is not embracing uh, the, the, the things that God has for us because we keep wanting something that, that uh, 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 we want the destiny, we want the victory, we want the glory, but we don't want to embrace the cup. You know, uh, uh, oftentimes transformation requires us to go through Gethsemane. You know, the word Gethsemane means olive press. You know what they do at Olive Press in the old days? I've been to an Olive Press uh, in Jerusalem, you know, uh, in 2016. And we went to this place where they did it. They would take the olive, they would, uh, from the olive tree, now listen, they would take a stick and they would beat it, the, the tree, and the olive would come. Jesus was beaten. That's, he was beaten. And so they would beat the olive and it would fall. And then what they do is they gather it into these wicker baskets, okay? And they put it in, and then they bring it, and they put it at the edge of this uh, um, press, okay? And then the, at the one side is these big, giant stones that is hooked up to this press. And they would lower it, the stone, and it would just, boom, it would hit that Press. And they would leave those stones, these giant stones, these big stones, it's like big weights, and they would leave it there, okay, and the oil would run out. And they would call that the first press. Ah, and that oil would run out, and you know where that oil would be used? They would only be used in the temple. They only would use that in the temple. They would give it to the priest, and the priest would use it to light the candelabra uh, uh, and, and use it within the temple. And then when it's all dry, they take it again, they add another big stone, and they crush it, boom, again. Right? Another big stone, they add it to the weight, and they crush it, and they let all that oil from the olive come out. And they would use it for perfume. Okay, they, uh, the, the, they would mix perfume and they would mix things. Sometimes they would make candles out of it uh, with beeswax and all kinds of things, uh, the nice things. And then once all that is dry, they take all of the wicker basket and they put it all together and they take a big old stone and they add it to it and it would just boom again. And the last press is what they use to cook. And they would use the light, uh, 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 the candles in their homes. That's where we get the lamp oil. That, that is the last press. That, that's when everything, all the good stuff is gone. You get the last things, but yet it's still useful. And, and once that all that happens, then they would take the olive and they would dry it and they would give it to their animals and all these things. And here, Jesus himself is going through a press and he says, Father, 
All things are possible. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, the struggles that you are going through and God is trying to transform you, is God is trying to tell you, and you are trying to say, God, I know it's possible that you could take this struggle from me. I know it's possible that you can give me what I want. I know it's possible that you can uh, allow me not to have to drink this bitter cup. I know it's possible because all things things in you is possible. But for you to be a man or a woman of purpose and destiny, you got to drink the cup. See, a lot of people want the victory. They want the destiny. They want all the great things that come with being a person of Christ and a person of destiny while destiny is waiting, but you can never get destiny the way God wants without going through the press. You know, Jesus would have never went to the cross if he didn't go to Gethsemane. Think about it. Because the more he was crushed in Gethsemane, the Bible says that he would sweat blood because he felt the weight of the world upon him. Could you imagine feeling, you know, the, I was showing you about, uh, telling you about the oil press and they would put stones. Could you imagine being pressed by the whole planet? Well, no wonder why he started sweating blood. Because that would kill you and me. And we don't think about it. Oftentimes, we say, Lord, take this struggle from me. Take this suffering from me. Take my barrenness from me. Take my, uh, uh, my lack from me. Take my this and take my that. And God was sitting saying, yes, I can take it from you. But if I take it from you, you won't be pressed enough. You won't struggle enough. You won't be with me enough so that I can tra transform you. See, when, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, while he had his 12, he left them, and he brought his three, John, James, and Peter. Remember, the brothers fell asleep. <laughs> brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, there's going to be a point in your life that the destiny and the victory and the things that you desire, you can't, people can't go with you. You have to deal with it on your own in that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, you and Jesus. And if you can get to you and Jesus, and you and Jesus and the Father above can deal with you and allow him to press the oil out of your life, you're going to have one of the greatest ministries and testimony of helping other people. Because the only way you and I can benefit is when the oil comes out of our life. See, the oil has to come out. That's the transformation. And you cannot take an olive. If you want that oil, that, oil, that olive has to be transformed, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it? But I don't want it. It looks so pretty. I remember uh, uh, my kids, we take them somewhere and they have these beautiful cakes and, you know, um, I don't know, we, we have this dessert, it's gelatin, you know, uh, uh, and, and it, they could make a shape of a fish and all this, this, and, and I remember, you know, we order it and it's beautiful, you know, some of a fish, some flower and everything, the decoration, right? And the kids go, but it's too pretty to eat. And I said, but, but if you don't eat it and you just look at it, it won't benefit you. And see, brothers and sisters, when we only want the beauty and we don't want to deal with the crushing, we cannot have beauty for ashes until there's ashes. You can't have a testimony until you have the struggle. And you can't have Jesus. Jesus can't die for us until he's been crushed. And the moment he was crushed for our sin and our, our, our wickedness and all of the things, the anointing cannot come out. That's why the Garden of Gethsemane represented an oil press because it had to press Jesus. And that oil from Jesus came out. And he knew what he had to deal with. Brother and sister, can I tell you, stop fighting the process and start asking God, help me through this process, and the quicker I can learn from this process, the quicker I can be a, a person of destiny and purpose and be used by you. Oh, you, you didn't think I was in Dallas just watching volleyball or, and not thinking about Jesus, do you? See, a lot of times... We keep saying things like this, like, but I don't feel like it. 
You've you got to understand, Jesus didn't feel like it either. Jesus didn't feel like being crushed. You know, what is amazing to me is he knew what is about to happen. I often ask God, Lord, why don't you let me know? He goes, because you wouldn't go. You know, so, you, can, can we be honest? If, if we knew some of the things that we had to go through, brothers and sisters, we wouldn't say, yeah, pick me. <laughs> Lord, not thy will, but my will <laughs> be done. Come on, somebody. Yeah, we often think, say, no, pastor, I got faith. No, no, no. Uh, you only have faith is because you don't, sometimes I'm glad I don't see what's coming. Because if I knew what was coming, I'd be like, no, no, no. You got the wrong address. Lord, you got the wrong LT chunk. You got the wrong chunk. You got the wrong Ramirez. You got the wrong pa. You, you got the wrong uh, Herrera. You got the wrong wind. You got the wrong gore. You got the wrong dude. But see, the, the thing is, we, we keep embracing and we never get out of the, that moment. We keep embracing Gethsemane. But the moment he says, Lord, I know you can take this from me. Can I, can I tell you, brothers and sisters, if you're a person that has given your life, like Brother Matt said, that your life is not your own, can I tell you, if it isn't your own, then you've given your life to someone. And if it's not your own and you've given your life to someone, does that someone not have a right to do with your life as he wishes? Yeah? Does he not have to allow, or does he not have the right to transform you and break you and take all the stuff that he doesn't want in you out? And we hold on to it with the, all the fingernails, all the claw. We come kicking and biting and screaming. And God is sitting there saying, if you only knew what you have to do. I said, yeah, but I got to go to the cross. And the Lord, Jesus says, your Lord, not your will, because he knew the cross was temporary. But life after after is eternal. See, brother and sisters, you got to stop looking at your situation right now. Because if you look at your situation right now, and if you look at your struggle right now, if you look at uh, what you're dealing with right now, you will never get out of the garden. You will constantly say, I don't want this cup. I don't want this cup. I don't want this cup. Jesus prayed it one time. I don't want this cup. I don't want to be here. Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to be here. I don't, I don't feel like I need to be here. I don't want to preach anymore. I don't want to minister anymore. I don't want people calling me anymore. I don't want to lead Bible study anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want my marriage anymore. See, we keep getting in the garden. And God's saying it's time to get out of the garden and stop embracing what you've got to embrace. Go ahead and embrace it and move forward. You know, oftentimes we, we want, but greatness never comes cheap. Because if glory was cheap, I wouldn't want it. If greatness was, was cheap, you wouldn't want it. You know, over this weekend, uh, we were in Dallas, and I'm walking through, and there's this huge convention center. And there's like 130 volleyball courts. You ever seen what 130-something volleyball courts look like? It's crazy. Okay? I mean, like, wow. Okay? I mean, the, imagine the George R. Brown is like that. And every area is filled with courts. Balls flying everywhere. You know, people walking around. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. And what I recognize is here's some of the top teams. They got some of the best players. I saw young, young women, or teenagers, 15 years old, six foot three, six four. They, they had the University of Houston coaches and scouts there, LSU, Virginia Tech, Auburn, Alabama, looking at these young ladies playing. And I, and I recognize that they were looking for something. And, and, and they're all, they, when you look at them, you, they all can play. And they're all tall. And they're all good. And I wonder what they were looking for. And I remember I heard some, a coach says that they're actually looking for the ones that can fight through the struggle. 
Because in a game, it's a momentum. It's up and down, and you're going to win, and you're going to lose. They want a young lady who can overcome that struggle. There are sometimes we don't want to embrace what God has for our life. Instead of saying, God, I want something different, say, God, help me until we can get to a place and say, God, if this is your will, and then help me move forward. Get me out of the garden, because if I know I can get out of the garden, we can move faster. Because Jesus could have stayed in that garden a little longer. But he said, no, let's just get it on and let's move forward and let's deal with it. Some of us need to do that. And the minute I stop complaining about the struggle, the minute I stop saying, God, I don't want this anymore. I just say, fine. If this is what I got to go through, I'm going to embrace my future and let go of this and not worry so much about the uh, temporary pain and struggle. And I started embracing what's ahead. I say, OK, let's deal with this because it's just but for a moment. It hurts. It stinks. But you know what? I hated feeling. And I imagine Jesus got tired of sweating blood. You know what I'm saying? He said, okay, I, I know I got a deal, but at least I can die. But sitting there, sitting here for a day, two days, three days, four days. Some, some, could you imagine some of us that go through, could you imagine people that go through the things for a month, two months, a year, ten years? Five years and say, and they keep saying, Oh God, I wish you, I would. And instead of saying, God, not your will, not my will, but your will be done, not my will, but your will be done, not my will, but your will be done, let me take this. And if it is for my better and my purpose uh, and my destiny, help. And you know what? I look at, at the men and women through the the, the Bible, the ones that embrace the struggle and the one that says, God, not my will, but your will, they began to rewrite history. And we read about them. You look at Abraham at 70 years old. He says, hey, uh, you need to leave your country. Genesis chapter 12. Just leave, you, leave your father, your mom, everybody, and go to another country you've never been. And he leaves. He leaves. Who would do that? Embrace the struggle, right? And then he has to deal with his nephew. He embraced that. And it, it is not us, or it's not God, but it is us that wants to relent our will. You know what Matt said? He said that animals that were sacrificed in the Old Testament didn't have a choice. You and I had a choice. But if your life is not your own, really, you don't have a choice. You just stay in Gethsemane for a while. I don't know about you. But I don't want to be under the press so long. Let us be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Can I tell you something, brothers and sisters? The struggles you're going through, the pressing you feel, the things that you've done, it is because the anointing and the oil that is required, or I say this, needed in this world comes from you. Because I don't have the experience you have. And there's somebody that might have the same experience. And, and in your life, they would come to you and say, how did you overcome that, Brother Danny? How did you overcome that, Brother Danny? How did you end up raising three girls? How did you end up staying married as long? How, how did you end up raising three boys? How did you end up, how did you overcome, how did you, how did, how did you deal with loss? I, mean, I got a friend in California, he's a pastor. And he, he held his teenage daughter in his arms when she died because somebody ran a red light when she's crossing the street. She was 16 years old. And then on his second daughter's wedding day, I was there, and I, I just felt I needed to come. What his wife was, she was battling cancer. And we attended the wedding ceremony. We took his daughter and her, his new son-in-law to the airport. On the way back, they rushed, she, she had been rushed to the hospital and she died. I preached a sermon the next day. And I, and I thought, here's this man that has gone through these things. I said, brother, how do you do? He, said, he told me, he said, I was never really angry with God. He goes, I, I, I would never. He goes, there was days where I was upset because I missed my daughter. And I went through that and I missed my wife. You know, and now, there, you know, his daughter died, you know, his wife died years after his daughter. But still, he, he, he dealt with tragedy in his life of a father losing a child. 
Then he, he, he loses the woman that he's loved ever since middle school, right? And I asked him, he said, I was never upset, you know, or angry with the Lord. And I said, did you ever wonder why? He goes, yeah, I wonder, but I never asked. And, and he said, man, I, I just said, Lord, I know that you're going to use this for the kingdom. And what I learned was this man who I've speak to quite often came my brother and he's not even of the Asian culture. And he's helped me through certain things. And, and when I speak to him, he has a peace and a comfort. And he said, knowing that, hey, hey, brother, this life is temporary. You better keep your focus on what you're supposed to do here on this planet right now. Because when we get to heaven, hey, it's going to be on. It's going to be fun. He said, don't worry about it. And I thought, man, how does this guy? I, and when I talk to him, he never compares the pain <coughs> because he says pain is always relative. But what he, he encourages me is, what are we doing at this moment? You know, the anointing on your life, the pressing you go through, how can that oil help other people? You know, and his oil has helped me when I shed tears. He, his oil helped help me when I was going through the press. And he said, man, he, he would ask me, he said, when he hears certain things, he would, how did you deal with that? Because I'd never gone through what you've gone through. And I'm like, man, brother, what I'm going through is nothing compared to what you go through. But it's all relative because why? God needs your anointing. God needs the oil. God needs that press that's coming from you. So allow God. You know, one of the things I heard uh, from a professor here in Houston, University of Houston. And it was a, a TED talk I was listening to. It was introduced by a pastor friend of mine also in California, another one. And she is a researcher because she, she has a degree in social uh, uh, sociology. And one of the things that she was studying for six to ten, ten years now was the idea of shame. And she said that one of the things people don't recognize is when she did this research is all the things about being vulnerable. Dr. Brown was saying, everything that you think being vulnerable, oh, what if I'm vulnerable, what people think? He said, the people that are overcomers of that are the people that do great things. The point of your vulnerability is the launching pad of your purpose. It is, she said, if you, if you show me a person that is, uh, 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 it's not that they like it, it's not, but they're okay with it. They've embraced it. They embrace that struggle. They embrace that pain. They embrace it. He goes, you show me that person that, that uh, is vulnerable and they deal with it in a, uh, instead of trying to cover it up or be ashamed of it. You show me that person, I, I can show you a man or a woman that's doing great things. Brothers and sisters, Jesus shared with us that even in that very moment, he was born to die and he, at that very moment, show us his vulnerability, his human side. I thank God for that scripture in Mark 14, because it showed me that Jesus was human. Because how many often have said, Lord, can you just take this from me? But what we got to recognize is, instead of asking him to take it and say, God, is this, is this your will? Is this your will because you have a greater plan and a purpose and destiny for me? And that all will come from my life to benefit other people? I know it's not popular today to preach about struggle and this. It's more popular to say, you know what? Uh, you got God overcome everything. Everything's good. Uh, you know, just name it and claim it, brother. You know, um, you're, you're, you know and I, what I recognize is... <laughs> I got struggles. I've got things. I don't want that. But what I realize is I want to be transparent. I want to be vulnerable. I want to let people know, Lord, it's not my will, but it's your will. And when you allow God to break your will and transform you by the renewing your mind, think different, you're going to have an opportunity for God to use you and bring you through doors and get you through places. I'm not telling you it doesn't hurt, because boy, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. And does it taste good? No, it doesn't. I wish I had a tea bag. But sometimes you got to drink that cup so that you can move forward.
Because without going through what I've gone through, some of you would never be trained as ministers as you are today. Just think about it for a minute. Wouldn't have what you have today. Take the opportunity. Take the opportunity to really ask the Lord, Lord, I'm here. I don't want to struggle in Gethsemane. I want to get up and move forward. Let us stand.